Abba Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your seventh day, your day of rest. Father, I pray that no matter how we come in today, be it tired, frustrated, ecstatic, I pray that you'll just meet us, Lord, or more accurately, that we'll meet you. Father, I pray that you'll be with us today as we go through this service, as we go through this time of teaching. I ask all of this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So, ever have one of those wake up moments? I did this week. I went, oh, Passover's in two weeks. Oops. <laughs> okay, this one, you know, it's, it's always a month after Purim is when Passover starts. And for some reason, it really just hadn't clicked that it was two weeks away. So that was like, oh, well, okay, let's start thinking about getting ready for Passover. And that's what we're going to talk about today. A good day and a bad day is your attitude. And the same thing is going to apply to Passover. The only difference between a good Passover season and a bad Passover season is your attitude. So you can really approach Passover with dread you know, hey, I got to clean. I've got to start reading my labels. I got to clean out my pantry. I've got to clean my refrigerator. Da da da, kvetch, kvetch, kvetch. And miss the opportunity that God has for us because we get so tied up in the details. Now, details are important, okay? But it's your choice. You choose how you approach the details. You can either choose to approach them with dread. Or you can choose to approach them with anticipation and wonder and reverence. So the question is, what's your choice? How are you going to choose to approach this Passover season? Now, first of all, today, we're going to kind of take this a little basic, is that we're gonna, I'm going to be using the word Seder a lot. And what does this word mean? Seder is the Hebrew word that means order. And in this case, it specifically refers to the order of the service, the prayers and the activities for the evening of Passover. And it all comes from Exodus 12 that recounts the time of when the Israelites left Egypt. Now, the Seder is guided by a booklet called a Haggadah, which comes from the Hebrew word meaning to explain or to narrate. Now, in Exodus 13.8, it says that the Israelites were instructed, tell your child on that day, and if you want to know what that day is, go on up, saying that it is because of what God did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. So on the basis of this passage of scripture, it's considered a duty to narrate the story of Exodus on the eve of Passover, to pass it along to future generations, but also to remind ourselves of what our history is and the redemption that God provided at that time. So the Seder becomes the word that we use for the evening, signifying this festive meal and the retelling of the story. And the Passover Seder has 15 steps, if you really look at it, that you go through. Now, I'm not going to go through all those steps today. Um, we can always talk about You can find me later and we can talk about it. But here's the thing. Your Seder can be a grand production. You know, there are just some people who love to host, love to have parties. They get into it. They go on Pinterest. They Google search. So it can be a grand affair, or it can be a very simple affair. It's what you make of it. But here's the thing. We can get so tied up in doing everything perfectly that we don't do anything at all. Oh, I don't have a Seder plate. Do I have the right Seder plate? Do I have the right Haggadah? Have I cleaned my house well enough? I don't have enough time to do all of this. All this narrative starts running around in our head, especially us ladies. Okay? But don't let unrealistic expectations, you know, you think, oh, my family expects X, Y, and Z. Oh, my neighbor did this. My friend did that. I can't do that. Or your preconceived attitudes, your hectic life, or whatever excuse that you want to come up with, because we're really good at finding excuses, aren't we, to keep you from missing out on the beauty of the season. So before I get down to 
breaking Passover simple for you, I do want to address one issue. And the issue is, why do we do this? Why should we go to all of this trouble? Well, first of all, God's word tells us to do this. Leviticus 23 verses 4 through 5 tells us that this is one of God's appointed times. So guess what? God's saying, show up for the appointment. Okay? You know, you get called to, the, call, call to your boss's office. Is that optional or is that mandatory? You know, usually you get called to your boss's op- office. It's not an optional thing. You better show up. Well, God's telling us, show up for the appointment. Okay? Then, in Numbers 9, verses 14, it says, A foreigner residing among you is also to celebrate the Lord's Passover in accordance with its rules and regulations. You must have the same regulations for both the foreigner and the native-born. So guess what, guys? From the very beginning, God made allowances, so to speak, for the non-Jew to celebrate Passover. So this wasn't something that suddenly got put into the, in, in the New Covenant as an afterthought. It's there in the Torah. Okay? And don't remember, shouldn't have to say it, but I am. You know me. The Bible is a complete book. There's really not an Old Testament and a New Testament. It's all one book. It's all one continuous story. And it's not a buffet that you get to pick and choose what you want to do. Okay? Secondly... And most, not most importantly, because God's word is the most importantly, is the most important. But secondly, we, I'm speaking to the adults in here, are to be role models for future generations. Luke 2.14 says, every year Yeshua's parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. Yeshua's parents, uh, raising the son of God here, can you imagine the responsibility and the feeling of that, we're role models. Look, we're going, this is a festival where you go to Jerusalem. We go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They didn't take a pass because they were raising the Son of God, did they? No. They celebrated Passover. They kept the laws of Adonai. Proverbs 22.6 says, train a child in the way that he should go, and even when he's old, he will not swerve from it. So, if we don't celebrate Passover in our homes, why should our kids? Why should our grandkids? If they don't see the importance and experience the importance of Passover, why do we go, oh, why, why aren't they doing this? Why are they going another direction? Because you didn't do it in your house. You didn't make them a part of the process. And if you don't, it, it honestly doesn't need to all fall on the wife of the house. It really kind of needs to be a family affair. Because the best way to teach is to let them do. So you find out what can they do to help you. You know, if there's something that doesn't have to be done 100%, let your little ones get started. But if we don't bring in this younger generation and get them involved in the part of the process, how are they going to know what to do? And are they even going to want to do it? And this needs to come from us, not as, oh, it's Passover. I guess I have to do this. It can't be an obligation. It's got to come from a heart that wants to serve God. It's a heart God-serving motive, not a, oh, I've got to do this YouTube motive. You know, oh, I don't know how to do this. Let me go YouTube it. Okay? Quick fix. No, it comes from the heart. Titus chapter 2 gives us a great role model where the older generation, instead of being cast aside, teaches the younger generation. And specifically, the whole goal of a Titus 2 woman is to train the younger women, in biblical, simple-to-measure, spirit-empowered, love-based living. And the women are to have spiritual integrity. They're to be godly women. They live what they teach. So you can't teach about Passover if you don't live Passover. They train other women in the ways that they have learned. And their walk speaks louder than their talk. 
So if we don't train the old, this next generation about the importance of living out God's commands, not just lip service, but actually living it out, how can we blame them for taking a different path? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and Rabbi's not here to grimace when I say things, that if you're not doing Passover in your home, you're failing in your mission and your duty to future generations. And then every year, instead of making the effort to do Passover in your home because you find excuses and you buy into those excuses, and you go to a ministry host at Seder, and don't take it upon yourself, you're missing the mark. Let's swing back around to that Exodus 13.8. It says, tell your child. That's a direct command to the parents to instruct their kids, not having someone else do it. It says, tell your child. Well, you know what? Terry and Daphne's kids aren't my kids. I have my own kid. I am to tell my kid, not their kids. Okay? But what if I don't have kids at home? What if I'm single? What if this? What if that? What if the other? The commandment still stands, guys. Again, we can't pick and choose. So invite others. If you're an older woman, invite younger women to walk along with you in this then. Okay? Have a potluck Seder and assign people to bring food. There's numerous ways to bring the Seder experience alive in your household without killing yourself. It's your choice if you want to kill yourself, okay? But there's a lot of ways to do it and make it easy, okay? And remember, Passover isn't just the first night. That kicks off our spring feast. Then we go into the entire feast of unleavened bread. We still have the responsibility to stay away from leaven, so what do you do? Swap recipes with your families and your friends. You know, if you've got young kids, have them research new recipes that they would like to try. Okay, buy a Passover cookbook. I can't tell you how many I have. I love my Passover cookbooks. They all have little sticky notes all in them. And I cycle around every year and figure, oh. And then there are certain things I have to do because I get asked by the family to do. So anyway, but what I want to do today is I'm going to start with the first objection. Okay, and the first suggestion is, I don't have a Seder plate, and I can't afford to buy one. Well, believe it or not, you can go to the dollar store. You can go to Walmart, and you can get what you need to make a Seder plate. Now, again, I do what I teach. I went to the dollar store yesterday. So, we're going to have a little show and tell, because this is what Judy does. And we were in the dollar store less than 10 minutes, Okay. And probably for 10 minutes and 8 bucks, you can get what you need to do for a Seder. Now, I spend a little more because I give you multiple options because I'm Judy, right? Okay, so, number one, a platter. Looks pretty, right? Nice and dollar plastic. Okay, platter number one. <gasps> platter number two. Each a dollar, okay? Now... We need little cups to hold our elements. So look here. Creative. I am not creative, guys. I'm not. I'm really not. I, I, I'm very linear. I'm very black and white. But these are little, like, candle votives. So if you want to fill, instead of just having a little representation of everything on your Seder plate, you want to fill up and serve from there, you can do that. So we're going to set these here. Excuse me as I bend. And look. And they're, oh, and they're little concave, so they're really even pretty. Yes. You guys are going to think I've lost my mind. Oh, there's the other one. Okay. So, look here. Voila. Seder plate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bucks, guys. So, I said eight bucks with tax, okay? Or, now, I will be honest with you. These little glass bowls are one of my favorites. I have a lot of these in my house. So here you get four for a dollar, 25 cents each, okay? And these are perfect. These will go on this plate also. I actually, ooh, we broke one. Watch, watch the fingers here. Um, I actually use these two to, um, for my Seder, and I put them in front of everybody's plate with the salt water, so when they dip the parsley, you got it right there. All right, I'm not going to pull the other one out, but you guys get the idea. I do have six of these. These can go on this type of plate also. 
Ooh, ooh, glass. Last but not least, we found these little, and in fact, I bought enough of these for my Seder this year. These are even a little more decorative, a little prettier. And again, you can just set them right here on your plate, kind of make them look pretty, and voila, Seder plate. So, I don't want anybody to tell me you can't do Passover because you don't have a Seder plate. Because I've just taught you, let me pick up this glass, how you can make a Seder plate really quickly with $10, not, not even $10, 10 minutes and $8, okay? 10 to 1, you guys could go shop, shop in your own cabinets, you know? You don't have to come up with the fine china. Find a pretty tray. I nearly brought my other one. I have this really pretty wood tray that I bought from Walmart that I keep, like, our fruit that doesn't have to be um, refrigerated on. Use that. Put some pretty bowls. Mix and match. There's plenty of options, guys. Okay? But remember, if you're doing it for the first time, the Seder tends to be really kind of a plate-slash-dish-heavy affair. So, you, again, you don't have to use the fine china. Dollar store will cover all your needs, because a lot of mine are from the dollar store. I will tell you that. Um, you'll be amazed at what you're going to find, and you're not going to break the budget. So we've overcome one objection right there. And remember, Passover does not have to be Pinterest or Facebook picture worthy. Okay? It's, it's, it, again, that's unrealistic expectations when you go on Pinterest and you put in Passover and you see all of these beautiful tables and you're like, I can't do that. The best thing to do, I, I actually Googled this, so you guys can Google it too, is Google Passover at Dollar Tree. And there's actually an article from a lady who, because you can order from the Dollar Tree also, she buys these blue plates and silver stuff and that's how she does her Passover. So there's ways to do this on a budget, okay? So when you're gonna get started, you really need to think about what do you want your Seder to express? What is it gonna express about your family? What memories do you wanna create for your children and your grandchildren and for those that are gonna share your table? Now, some people have serious Seders, okay? Formal clothes, fancy plates, okay? Some families have fun satyrs, especially if there's a lot of little kids running around, okay? They're going to incorporate show and tell. They're going to dress up in costumes. They'll act out the ten plagues. How do you make it your own, okay? How do you make it a reflection of you? You know, and if you're, if you're a more casual family, and then one year you decide you're going to want to have a formal satyr, it's going to feel uncomfortable, right? It's not going to feel natural. So stay within what's going to make you comfortable so you're going to be more willing to do it. Now, I'm not saying that change isn't a good thing and, and not to change things up, but don't change it up so much that it becomes foreign. You know, Passover should feel good like a pair of comfortable shoes. You know, you put me in high heels and I'm going to be very uncomfortable. You stick me in a pair of flats and I'm good to go. So have your Passover feel comfortable, okay? And make traditions for this time of year, but understand that your traditions aren't going to happen overnight, okay? Now, our family Seder that we have doesn't look like the Seder that Scott grew up with. Doesn't look like the Seder that I participated in with his family. I mean, we, we wore nice clothes and we had a table, you know, everybody was at the table and Natalie would hire someone to come in and help serve, you know, so it was kind of easy. I don't do that, but we've still kept some of the core. You know, in the Passover Seder, it talks about crossing the Jordan, and we have a nephew who's named Jordan, so we always emphasize the Jordan, and even though he's not, he's married, has his own child, we still do that. It's just our family thing, okay? So we've kept our core, but we've adapted it. You know, we now have a little one. We have an under three-year-old. So our satyrs have changed a little bit because we've got to accommodate for the little one. Okay? But the holidays are a time to really strengthen family bonds. Okay? And think about it. Think about the best dinner party 
you've ever been to. What made it so special? Was it that special recipe? Maybe the stories and the conversations? You know, but there's something about having an event inside your house. The energy that it creates, the memories. Yes, even the jammed fingers having to move, you know, furniture and the little slices you get from the knives every once in a while because the knife slipped. Okay, but it ended up all being worth it. You got done with the evening and went, this was really great. We've got to do this again. Okay, so I get it. I really do get it, guys, that doing your first Seder really may see a daunt, seem like a daunting task. Okay, but with a few simple checklists, you can have everything running really well. Okay, but the thing is, start small. If you've never celebrated Passover before, start small, but at least do it. Don't let the fear of, I don't know what to do, or I can't do it like so-and-so, keep you from celebrating Passover. So the question is, what do I do first? So the first thing you need to do is familiar, familiarize yourself with the holiday. Okay? Creating a Seder means you need to go through the Haggadah, because all, all Haggadahs are different, you know, to see what do we do when, what do I want to do here. Plan out what your Seder is going to look like. And if you're really kind of overwhelmed, make a schedule for that evening. The goal is to create something that's going to be smooth so you can be relaxed and you can enjoy it too when you feel prepared and not just go with the flow. All right? So start small. Come and ask Rabbi and, and myself. You know, use the resources that we have on the city. We're here to help you. Okay? Number two... Make a game plan of what you want to accomplish, set the dates to have it finished, and enlist your family to help you. Okay? Again, starting small. Make a list. Now, I'm telling you, if you go search Passover cleaning list online, you're going to get very overwhelmed. They are very, very overwhelming. I mean, this is where the whole idea of spring cleaning came from. I mean, they clean cars. They clean backpacks. They clean coat pockets, okay? You can get very, very overwhelmed, okay? Make your own list of for what you personally want to accomplish, okay? Once you have all of that, start your house cleaning process, okay? And a part of that, you're going to inspect your house and get rid of any traces of hummets. Now, what is hummets? The word hummets means fermented or leavened, specifically the, de the yeast that makes dough rise. And it can be used to refer to any product containing grain which has been exposed to water for 18 minutes without manipulation. And those grains become hummus. And it's, you're looking at wheat, spelt, barley, oats, rye, all of those things. Also, beer, because it's been fermented. Um, whiskey, other grain alcohol products. You'll be amazed at where you find it, okay? But why do we do this? Again, going back to God's word, Exodus 12, 15 says, eat matzah for seven days. By the, f by the first day, you must have your home cleared of all leaven. Whoever eats comets on the first day to the seventh day will have his soul cut off from Israel. And then in 19 through 20, it says, during these seven days, no leaven may be found in your homes. If someone eats anything of hummus, his soul will be cut off from the community of Israel. This is true whether he is a convert, non-Jewish, or a person born into the nation. You must not eat anything leavened. So, think of your Passover cleaning as any place where there's a good chance that food has been taken to. You know, if food never goes in your laundry room, don't worry about your laundry room. Okay? If you're, you don't allow food in your bedrooms upstairs, don't worry about your bedrooms. You know, I have a husband who likes to eat in my family room. Every week, I have to tip up the recliner and <laughs> vacuum underneath it. Yeah, we find pistachio shells. It's great. Just telling you. So, yes, my family room gets cleaned for Passover because... 
Yeah, we have to get the vacuum cleaner down in all the little crevices of, the, of his chair. So, so just be on the lookout for these little crumbs that get left around. You know, Natalie's latest thing is this fermented drink. She likes it. I can't get past the smell. So, you know, I'm, th she's got to finish those by the time, you know, she's got two weeks to finish the, I think, three bottles that she has. And then they have to go and she'll have to do without for a week. So, but make a list of the rooms that you want to get to and then cross them out as you get them done. And then tell your kids or your spouse, in my case, my dogs too, because they go take their treats to other rooms. <laughs> yes, dog treats, you got to look at those too, believe it or not, or cat treats, Miss Cheryl. Um, that no food leaves the kitchen. You know, the house is a no food zone, okay? But drapes, window treatments, chandeliers don't have to be cleaned unless you're hanging from your chandelier eating food. You don't really have to do that, okay? You know, little dust, little swipe of the little wool thing takes care of it. You know, if you do swing from your chandelier and eat, good for you. I'm proud of you, okay? So, start small. If this is your first year, just worry about your kitchen, okay? Don't worry about the rest of the house. Just get the kitchen done, okay? Again, this is a place where the enemy is going to defeat you. Okay? He's going to play mind games with you. And he's going to make you think you're never going to get your house clean enough. Okay? But in the midst of cleaning our house, there's also a little bit of a spiritual exercise that we need, we need to do. So when you're cleaning your physical house, think about your spiritual house. Okay? Why are we commanded to remove the hummus? Because it represents a corrupting influence a hidden uncleanness that manipulates the pure elements. Think of the influence of a small lump of leaven and a batch of dough. Spiritual leaven works the same way. And it's going to corrupt us from within. It's going to sour our inner life. And this yeast of the soul is, is going to be the, this pride that's going to manifest itself. It's going to be these things that we put, these idols that become more important than God and studying his word. It's the things we put, you know, in place of things that we give more priority to, you know. But it's also the baggage that we carry around from our broken promises, from failed relationships, from personal disappointments. It's kind of the refuge of daily living that gets dumped on us. Okay, and then it ends up leading us to making poor decisions or mistakes in judgment or moral failure. So what do you do with this? You know, the hummus that's in our house, we get rid of it, we pack it up, we sell it, we get, you know, we, re we remove it. That's easy to see. But when it's inside of us, it takes a little more digging. You know, we just can't sell a bad character trait, can we? Doesn't work that way, guys. You got you to gotta do the hard work. So as you're going through the house, do some spiritual house cleaning also. You know, when you're cleaning that family room, what's in that room that represents hummus to you? Is there some books? Is there some music? Is there some video games? What's in there that you could physically get rid of too, to help clean the physical. All right? Moving on. If you can't use all the products in your house, which contain the commas, in this day and age, families are on budgets. You know, it, it, you really can't just, oh, Passover starts tomorrow, I'm going to toss all this food. Most of us can't afford to do that with their budget right? Find it, pack it up, give it to a neighbor who doesn't celebrate Passover, number one, okay? Or clear out a corner of your garage, find a cabinet, stick it all in there, lock that cabinet, do not disturb tape, leave it alone, okay? Lock it up, because you know what? If you don't, again, the enemy likes to play with us. You know that little secret stash of Girl Scout cookies you have? 
they're going to start calling your name. Okay? Especially the Samoas and me. Of course, they still wouldn't be around here by Passover because they don't last long at our house. That and the thin mitts. Just saying. But they're going to, it's going to start, you know, we're denying ourselves. So the enemy is going to use that and it's going to start calling our name. You know? Ooh, those cookies. No, 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 no. Put it somewhere where you can't see it, can't touch it, lock the case, put the key somewhere where you can't get to it, give the key to somebody so you can't get it. Okay, anyway. Now, the next thing you want to do is plan your menu. Okay? Again, remember, there's certain things we're avoiding. So, you want to make sure that you're planning your menu so you don't need those things, number one. But also, there's certain elements that you've got to have. Okay? You've got to have your matzah. Or unleavened bread. Comes in 101 varieties now. There's egg matzah, there's salted matzah, there's gluten-free matzah, there's square matzah, there's round matzah. Matzah, okay? You've got to have salt water. Real easy, easy. Heat up some water, put some salt in it, let it dissolve, you're done. Don't even have to buy that. Most of us have water in our house and have salt, right? You've got to have your bitter herbs. If you really want to be bitter, you get that horseradish and you grate it yourself. And you're already starting to cry the tears, right? Um, I'll tell a little story. One year when we were doing the Seder here, I had to go buy horseradish. Well, Restaurant Depot here, um, close, didn't have it. So I had to go all the way downtown to the Restaurant Depot there. Well, believe it or not, the only horseradish they had was hot horseradish. So, okay, that's what they have. I gotta have it. I'm not gonna go buy, you know, 20 little bottles from the grocery store. So, we're getting it all ready. Now, Rabbi Scott loves horseradish, okay? So, that year, he's piling it on, <laughs> and he's piling it on. <laughs> he takes a bite and he chokes. <laughs> Yeah, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was rather hot, I have to say. Yeah, so it's supposed to be hot. You're supposed to cry tears. That's all I have to say. Leave it at that. Make, make your own if you want. Then you've got to have your wine or your grape juice, okay? And then you've got your five symbolic foods that are on your Seder plate. You have your shank bone. And honestly, you get a shank bone, you cook it, you prepare it, and then every year when Passover is done, stick it in the freezer. And then right before Passover, you pull it out again so you always have your shank bone. Except if you um, <coughs> leave it on the kitchen table and your dog can reach the kitchen table. And then your dog eats your shank bone. Yes, that has happened to us. Now I make sure the shank bones go hot. Actually, the shank bones get put up right away. So we don't lose shank bones anymore. Okay, you're going to have a burnt hard-boiled egg. I'll give you Judy's little tip. Make, boil it in tea bags. It makes it look burnt. Then you don't burn it in the oven because, yeah, I've done that too. So, yeah, just, you know, use like a three-gallon tea bag with an egg and let it sit in that tea. Comes out nice, toasty brown, just saying. You're going to have a green vegetable, parsley or um, romaine lettuce. you got your bitter herbs that we talked about, your horseradish. You have your herosis, your eggs, nut, wine mixture. Always make that a few days in advance. It tastes so much better. Um, you get your salt water, and then you have your matzah. So figure out what you're going to serve, how you're going to serve it, how are you going to cook it, how are you going to keep everything hot. Just plan it out, because when you have a plan and you can execute your plan, you're going to feel more confident, okay? Make your grocery list, because let me tell you, especially if you go to what we call the Kosher Kroger down at Toko Hills, and you walk in there and you see all of this, this huge section of kosher for Passover, and you start going, ooh, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and no, you really don't, guys, okay? <laughs> but my other thing is, support your local... You know, usually, you know, we all have to make that trip to Togo Hills to get what we need. Okay? But if your local store is starting to have, like, a little end cap of Passover stuff, support your local store. If they see that people will come in and buy it, they're going to be more willing to bring it next year. 
okay? Um, I went to the Kroger that's close to my house. I bought matzah. I bought macaroons. Um, I went to the Fresh Market in Snellville. They had some. So, yes, I'm buying probably stuff I won't use, but... <laughs> Oh, yes, the Fresh Market actually had the chocolate-covered marshmallows. It is so nice. You can find kosher marshmallows at Passover. So easy. Oh, yeah, I bought the um, toasted coconut-covered marshmallows. We like those, too. So support your local stores. If they're starting to bring a little bit of Passover stuff in, support that store so they'll keep doing it, okay? Now, you've done all your prep. It's the night before Passover starts. This is the night where you do your final search, for your hummus. But there's also a spiritual exercise that you can do this night. And this search is not unlike the search that we do before the fall high holidays, where we perform a spiritual inventory of our, of our spiritual, you know, we take an inventory, try this again, we take an inventory of our spiritual con condition. So, we're basically commanded to remove these impurities out of the house, but the same thing we need to do is remove inner impurities so that we can experience the truth as this new lump without any leaven. Okay? Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if there are any idol, idolous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So as you're removing your, how, your house of these influences, remove them spiritually also. Okay? Believers in Messiah understand or should understand that this removal of leaven from the home reflects the state of the heart. Okay? It says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So where there is unconfessed sin, where there's areas that we've locked away and won't let God in, represents obstacles in relating to God. And we have to realize that this feast of Passover is really foundational, okay? It's built upon the sacrifice of the lamb, which we hear Yeshua called the lamb of God in John 1, 29. Passover so points to our Messiah that we need to realize and internalize the importance of that. And you know, Passover is really like the analogy of sowing seeds and reaping a harvest, okay? The more you sow into your preparation of and then your participation in the feast, be it hosting a gathering, attending it, helping someone else, the more you sow into that, the more you're going to reap a spiritual harvest. And Passover gives us four major ideas that, at, that are at the heart of the Seder. And if we take these ideas and we incorporate them into our life, we're going to have some keys to lead a successful and productive life. And the first thing is memory. Remember is a biblical mandate that never really seemed important to anyone else before the Jewish people. Okay, It's the Passover story that initiated this commitment to remember. Tell your children every year. You know, history is the only way that we can really learn from the past. When we start erasing history, we start erasing lessons that we need. And memory links our past to our future. It turns history into destiny. Learning to treasure the history with all the bumps and all the bruises because, you know, the history of the Jewish people have a lot of bumps and bruises in it too, right? Is the first step to achieving greatness. Number two is optimism. 
To study the Passover story in depth is to recognize that the most difficult task Moses had to perform was not to get the Jews out of Egypt, but to get Egypt out of the Jews. Okay? They had become so conditioned to their status of slaves that they had lost all hope. You know, they had kind of lost the ability to think for themselves. They always had someone, get up at this time, do this, do that, do that. Their day, they, they, there wasn't independent thought. They had lost hope. But Moses came to give them the hope back. So the true miracle of Passover is the message that with God's help, no difficulty is insurmountable. You know, a tyrant like Pharaoh could be overthrown. A nation as powerful as Egypt could be defeated. Slaves could become free men. The oppressed could break the shackles of their captivity. Anything is possible if we dare to dream. And Moses gave the Israelites a dream. Number three is faith. Faith in a personal God gives us faith in ourselves, in our future, and our ability to change the world. You know, the God of Sinai didn't say, I am the Lord your God who created the heavens and earth. Instead, he announced, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. The God of creation could theoretically have forsaken the world once he had completed his task. But the God of the Exodus made it abundantly clear that he was still committed to our survival. The Passover story conveys that history is not happenstance. It follows the divine plan of the master. And last is family. Passover teaches us yet again another major truth. And that the way to perfect the world is to begin with our own families. God built his nation by commanding not a collective gathering of hundreds of thousands in a public square, but by asking the Jewish people to turn their homes into a place of family worship at the Seder, devoted primarily to answering the questions of the children. It kind of seems obvious. Children are our future. They're the ones that require the most of our attention. And the home is where we first form our identities and discover our values. So if we take these four ideals of memory, optimism, faith, and family, then we experience the Passover. So I hope today that I have kind of demystified getting ready for Passover for you. So just remember, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Don't approach Passover as something that you can never do. Okay? And lastly, spring cleaning is not a Torah obligation. Dust is not hummus. Stay focused on what you really need to do and leave the rest of the cleaning for another time. Thank you so much. I will leave my little Passover plates up here if you want to come take a look. All right, we're it, guys. You got two weeks. Get ready.